Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to our first lecture of the Spring Events Programme of the Ulster Society for Irish Historical Studies. I'm Dr Andrew Snedden, as Lindsay just um, said, and I'm the president of the USIHS, uh, which since 1936 has been championing Irish history in Northern Ireland and Ulster more widely, and laying on events like this uh, talk tonight. Our secretary, uh, Dr. Dara Gannon, will put up links in the chat function during the talk, and that will provide details of our website, our Twitter, and our Facebook account. You can listen to previous lectures on there and keep up to date with our program, uh, which is in collaboration with um, Prony. Due to uh, the ongoing COVID uh, crisis, these will all be online for the foreseeable, and they're bookable in the same way that tonight's lecture was. Um, Prony also puts it all on the website, as Lindsay said. So, uh, on with the kind of introduction uh, to uh, tonight's speaker. I've known tonight's speaker for an awful long time, and his remarkable body of uh, published work for even longer. Uh, Professor Martin Powell is the head of school uh, in the School of Humanities at uh, the University of Bristol. His research focuses on Irish, British and American political, social and cultural history in the 18th and 19th centuries. Professor Powell's publications are just too numerous uh, to, to name in detail here, but his in books include um, Britain and Ireland in the 18th century crisis of empire, the politics of consumption in 18th century Ireland, and uh, I'm going to try and get this out, uh, there's a bit of a tongue twister, Piss Pots, Printers and Public Opinion in 18th century Dublin, Richard Twissy's tour in Ireland. His most recent publication include work in political trials in Ireland and the return of white slavery to Irish history and historiography. He's currently editing a five volume edition of the political works of uh, Richard Brinsley Sheridan as well. This is part of a four year um, research project funded by the Leverhulme Trust. He's also a long standing interest and I've heard papers on this in history of violence and is currently working on a st study of uh, hawking and chalking provisionally titled Hawkers and Chalkers, uh, The Knife and Revolutionary Ireland, 1768-15. So tonight's talk is also, I think, the basis of a future book, and it's entitled Wolf Tone and the Hibernian uh, Catch Club, Sociability and Revolutionary Ireland. And I'll pass you over to, to Martin. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Andrew, for that, that, that typically kind introduction. Uh, and thanks to, to, to everybody for coming out tonight or not coming out for staying in tonight. Um, it, it's a huge shame for, for, for me that um, uh, that I can't I can't come over to Belfast. Um, I, I was obviously looking forward to it as, as I always do, but but I suppose the compensation is that is that this talk can be um, delivered to a much much wider audience, and that that can only be a good thing. I, I think the internationalisation of of these kinds of seminar series has has been one of the one of the the few boons of um, of, of of lockdown. So uh, the the topic today is is Wolf Tone and the Hibernian Catch Club, and uh, and and my interest in in this particular area, not not Tone, who, who I've worked on for a, a long a long time, although I, I, I would still not not describe myself as an expert on Tone. Um, but my interest in the Hibernian Catch Club dates to a, to a fellowship in, in, in Marsh's Library uh, in, in Dublin. Um, part of my, my broad interest in club culture and associational life in the, uh, in, in the 18th century, uh, early 19th century. And me working on the, the, the records of the Hibernian Catch Club, uh, which are now installed in Marsh's. And on, on one of the, the better days uh, there, I came across the entry of a new member, Theobald Wolf Tone. Um, it, it, was, it was one of those, those rather marvellous moments in the archives that um, one, one fairly rarely has. Um, I was very excited about this for, for some time. I became slightly less excited six months later when I, when I realised that, um, that a musicologist had written uh, a little on it in, uh, in, in the 19th century. Um, I, I found that material in, uh, in the Bodleian in, in Oxford. So, so I wouldn't pretend it, that, that um, the Wolf Tone's connections with, um, with music 
uh, and, and music clubs is entirely new because uh, because we're, we we were all aware through the biographies of um, of his interests there. Uh, and and uh, as I said, even even the, the some of the detail on his um, his membership of the of the, of the catch club was um, was in in, um, in in the public domain since the um, since the mid nineteenth century. But but I certainly think more could be made of it. So if I can, if I can begin properly, Theobald Wolfe Irish political radical best known of the leaders of the United Irish Rebellion of 1798, was a cultural polymath. Perhaps not top drawer in all areas, but a polymath nevertheless. He was an aspiring novelist with a little help from his friends, writing the Gothic satire Belmont Castle in 1790. One could also argue that he was exceptionally accomplished in the genre of diarist uh, and master of the epistolary craft. In diaries, letters and autobiographies, writing is highly entertaining, but also knowing. His engagement with the literary form is playful. He and his friends assume pen names and the dramatic roles that go with them. Indeed, it's arguable that his fame and influence would not have reached the dizzying heights seen from the mid 19th century onwards had it not been for his gift as a wordsmith uh, and his wife Matilda's careful preservation and then publication of a range of his writings. Tone also had an early dalliance with amateur theatricals, not only joining in with volunteer performances in Robert, Robert Owenson's Galway Theatre, but playing the male lead in John Holmes Douglas. Less well known, however, was that he was an accomplished singer, and in 1790, he joined the Dublin Musical Society, the Hibernian Catch Club. His diary shows that after a financial windfall, he paid for his membership to the club, but beyond this, we're, we're pretty much in the dark. Tone, of course, is extremely well known for his contribution to Irish associational culture. He was a founder member of the United Irishmen, established in Belfast in October 1791. But the Hibernian Catch Club membership must contribute to a further recasting of our understanding of Tone, a quintessential Enlightenment man, a leading light in the Dublin and Belfast public spheres. Marion Elliott, in her 1989 biography of Tone, was acutely aware of the need to flesh out his early life. Aspects of his early career, including his longing for military adventure, preparedness to enlist with the East India Company, as, and his imperial grand designs, have been too easily passed over by historians looking to position tone in an uncomplicated line of martyrs to Irish republicanism. Eliot, as with so many readers of and writers on tone, recognises the power of his prose and the way in which he uses his literary prowess to forge relationships. She's also alive to his sociable side, and indeed the frustrations that result from his isolated positions in America and France when in exile. Um, I, I do recommend to anybody, uh, anybody um, in, in need of uh, new reading material in lockdown to, to, to read Tone's diaries. He's, he is a master of the form and you really get a sense of his frustrations in, in, in America and particularly France. Early biographers, even those tending to the hagiographic were also alive to this. Sean O'Fallon saw him as Quote, the sort of man who must have dreamed so often of the gaiety as of the comfort he could bring to Ireland should his plan succeed. The Catch Club offers a window into a middling and upper middling sort sociability in Dublin. And the fact that it includes so many of those involved in Dublin's multivarious civil society in the 1790s makes it a particularly interesting case study. It also, it's also clear that the, that the Catch Club and its members had an intimate link with Dublin's print culture and that the frivolous and the fictional could exist happily and sometimes not so happily alongside the strict and the sententious. In particular, the development of radical politics in the 1790s makes any assessment of membership a potentially revealing exercise and could hint at functions and indeed tensions beyond those that we might come to expect in any grouping defined by artistic ability. What's also apparent, however, is that club memberships could be unexpectedly expansive, notwithstanding the heightened political tensions. And we also find that ideology did not always trump other forms of factious behavior. Of course, it would not do to forget that the Hibernian Catch Club was also a musical society and that these are worth studying for their own sake. Triona O'Hanlon provides a firm affirmation of this in her wide ranging 2018 essay on the Hibernian Catch Club. The star studded nature, sorry, um, Uh, the star-studded nature of, um, sorry, I'm um, paying the, the price for not, not having this in, 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 in paper form. Um, the star-studded nature of this club embracing 
uh, a wide range of Dublin's um, professions and personalities makes this one particularly worthy of note, but so does the quality of its output. It was connected to one of the greatest composers working in Ireland in this period, Sir John Stevenson, and one of Ireland's most accomplished singers, John Spray. The history of associational culture in the Irish context is in a relatively infant stage. Though histories of Irish clubs and societies have, one could argue, powered Irish historical study from the 1790s to the present day, those have for the most part been focused on their role in powering a political motor. And there's been much less interest in sociability and clubability. Though this was precisely the approach taken by Vincent Comerford in his book on the Fenians, which was determinedly associational, uh, while Nancy Curtin's United Irishman book uh, made a similar, if not so overt, contribution to our understanding of, of, of that particular group. Perhaps it's notable that for both Comerford and Curtin, their award is to be associated, associated with a certain kind of, um, of revisionist historiography, interesting in, interested allegedly in um, depoliticizing and demilitarizing Irish history. So at first glance, a body like the Hibernian Catch Club um, um, uh, is, is far removed from this highly politicized, even militarized associational culture that becomes so dominant in the 20th century. But I suppose what I would like to do is, with this club today is try and put the politics back in. And Wolf Tony is obviously a way of doing this in terms of politics with a capital P. But it could also be argued that the strictures associated with club culture are also political. Though Alexis de Tocqueville, Jürgen Habermas and Robert Putnam are keen on civil society, associational cultures, democratic potential, it also has to be recognized that part of the point of a club was to ensure exclusivity, meaning keep, keeping people out who are unclubbable. In this sense, I would like to argue that Tone was definitely in the clubbable category. He's immensely popular, even, even in this very early phase in his career. The Hibernian Catch Club works so well as a case study, I think, because though not famous or widespread in the way of the United Irishmen or, or, or Fenians, it had all of the requisite feature, features or strictures of a very political sort of club culture. It was also long lasting, and this also requires some understanding. Uh, and crucially, it also has surviving records um, held in Marsh's library, as I said at the outset. So I'll use the remainder of this talk to, to, to address some of these issues, focusing on how tone fits into the club, uh, what might be termed a prosopography uh, of its membership, and, and the tensions between music uh, and sociability, and that, that's the, the bit I'll, I'll end on. Um, but I should probably start by providing some background on the Hibernian Catch Club. The club was apparently founded in 1680, but the earliest members on its list date from 1748, and the club is still going today. Catches, uh, musical compositions for multiple parts, uh, but singing the same melody, albeit beginning at different times, um, tended to have a secular impulse. Glees were similar, uh, sung a cappella uh, with full harmony throughout, but unlike the catches, uh, they, um, there wasn't a requirement for those to be sung in the round. And I'll, I'll give you some examples in, in, in a moment. But generally in, in this paper, I'm not intending to linger on its musical aspects. Brian Robbins has written uh, a book called Catch and Glee Culture in 18th Century England. So I would direct anybody to, to that if, uh, if, if, if you have further interest in the phenomena. Um, and, and he looks at its musical significance as well as aspects of its associational culture. The Dublin Catch Club met from autumn to late spring. It dined once a month on Tuesdays. And outside of these gatherings, met weekly on the same day. Uh, it also organized galas, balls, and contributed to theatrical entertainments. Its meeting places are a guide to the trajectory of certain clubs and societies in this period. It started in fairly humble, humble dwellings, Flemings and Harrington's in Grafton Street, moved to Morrison's Hotel in Dawson Street, the Gresham Hotel on Sackville Street, and then the more bespoke ancient, conscien ancient concert rooms. Um, interestingly, its membership also tracked changes in fashionable addresses. So, so you see a, a congregation of members around um, Dame, the Dame Street area, if you, if you, if you, if you know Dublin, uh, but eventually the membership clusters around Merrion, uh, Merrion Square, uh, Merrion Street, um, th those, those newer parts of, uh, of, of 18th, early 19th century um, Dublin. As with other catch and glee clubs, then the Dublin club enjoyed a variety of music, some by serious, often religious composers, popular songs from the 17th century, 
works based on the poetry of Shakespeare and others, and a range of more recent composers like John Andrew Stevenson, who, who I've mentioned, who was, a, uh, who was a member. Some of these were ribald in tone, hence the occasional discomfort expressed by the authorities in Christchurch and St. Patrick's cathedrals. Uh, Brewer's turn amoralist to thy swain, for example, was innuendo laden and part of the October 1798 admissions test of the club. And I'm going to ask Lindsay to, to play some clips of two of the songs that were um, that, that were played in, in 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 the club when Wolf Tone was a member. Um, if you could um, could have a, if we'll, we'll have a minute of the um, of, um, of of the first, um, which is We Be Three Poor Mariners by Thomas Ravenscroft, and then we'll have Turn Our Amarillas. <laughs> I think perhaps we'll stop there. Perfect. And then turn amber or less to thy swain, which we know was sung in 1798. Turn amaryllis to thy swain, thy dame, and calls thee back again. Here is a pretty, pretty, pretty other boy, where Apollo, where Apollo dare not lie. There let's sit while I play, sing to my parks around to lay. Excellent. And, um, and clearly, will be available on, in all good record shops in Belfast if any of you are interested in, uh, in, in, in said music afterwards or, or at least findable on YouTube. So I'll switch now to Wolf Tone's um, direct involvement in, in the Catch Club. Um, while a member, and, and this probably is the, is the big undermining of my paper, Wolf Tone was rarely, rarely present at the club. Uh, and yet his membership is of interest because of what it says about a hitherto unexplored dimension of his life. The early 1790s were a, a, a critical period in Tone's political development. We see him move from Whig sympathies to a much more radical position. And of course, at the heart of this was the formation of the United Irishman in 1791. But although Tone's place in the Irish radical pantheon is secure, the nature of Dublin, of Irish society in this period, inevitably draws us back to a host of other connections and friendships that are much less convenient for our labelling. The way in which Tone interacted with the Hibernian Catch Club's membership offers some surprises, and in other ways confirms what we already knew or suspected. Tone had a broad range of friends across a number of professions, but perhaps more importantly, he was able to keep them. Constant backing, notwithstanding his hopeless attendance, is in many ways more revealing to us than him turning up, singing his parts, and then going home again. Tone, Tone's relationship with the Catch Club also says something significant about the nature of politics and associational culture in 1790s Dublin. Even this most conservative seeming body had a kernel of radicalism, and this applied to some of its professional singers as well as professional socialites. For much of the, of the period that, that, that I'm interested in, the Hibernian Catch Club had a membership dominated by the middling sorts. At the top of the social hierarchy of the club were the sons of peers like Ponsonby Moore, and a number of MPs, but the majority of members were from the professional classes or they were prosperous merchants. As the son of a successful coach maker who went to Trinity College Dublin and then on to London to the bar, Theobald Wolftone is a good fit for membership of the, of the club, though he would not have been one of its wealthier members. He was, however, something of a social climber, and it's also true that some of his Trinity College friends were from similar backgrounds. Uh, and also, um, uh, and, and also, men of great, uh, great talent. People like William Plunkett, later Attorney General and Lord Chancellor, was a was a close friend. Um, he also had very um, close connections with the with the Beresford family, and some of these are very useful when he when he tries to get out of Ireland alive um, in the in the room in, in the mid seventeen nineties. Wolf Tone's entry into the orbit of the club is interesting in a number of ways. Firstly. Given that this was 1790s, uh, 1790, it confirms that the multivarious nature of an individual's club culture 
continued into the early revolutionary period. Tone was a committed participant in club life in Dublin and elsewhere. He was a leading member of Trinity College Dublin's Historical Society, which um, offered him lively debate and lively sociability. And he also um, had uh, connections with the Catholic Association, the Galway Bucks and the Bar Club. Interestingly, uh, and, and one of the things I'm probably not going to talk about much today is the, is the rule bound, um, hide bound and rule bound nature of the, of the, of the catch club. Um, but Tony, it seems, is quite, quite keen on this kind of thing. He's very hot on procedure, well as well a member of, the, um, of Trinity, uh, Trinity's um, History Society. And, and of course, during 1790, most crucially, he worked on the formation of the, of the United Irishman, and that year um, also saw the, the first prototype club uh, formed in Dublin uh, with members including William Drennan and, um, and, and Thomas Russell. Now, most revealing for his membership of the Catch Club is the rule under which he was initially considered. This was no ordinary recommendation. Rather, it seems that his admission to the club was to be conducted under the auspices of a new rule designed to smooth the passage of particularly gifted singers. So he wasn't just a regular member proposed by, by, um, um, by, by existing members. Um, rather, he had a fast track because of his singing prowess. Uh, and, and I think that, that really is worth dwelling on. He would have been, um, so, so clearly he had a, a patron who was convinced of his musical abilities or was able to convince them of his musical abilities. He would have been expected to perform in front of a select group of the committee's senior singers, catch singers, uh, and be admitted or not as a consequence. There's no record of what tone might have been expected to sing, uh, unfortunately, but we do have details of other tests. Um, they, they seem pretty challenging. A, uh, a candidate in 1798, for example, was required to sing to the satisfaction of the committee, a part in nine different glees, um, and uh, another test made it clear that quite a few of these would be unknown to the applicant. Any expenses uh, accrued during the process were to be met by the proposer, uh, an indication that Tone had a committed backer. Uh, the committee appointed to him eventually included five of the most important members of the club. Uh, in the 1797 iteration of the club's regulation, regulations, it was specified that these were catch singers, the, 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 the musical professionals of, of the club, that many of these were actually professionals, they were paid for, for what they did. Um, some, were, some weren't professional singers, but many were, and they were attached to, um, to Christchurch and, and St. Patrick's, typically. In the event, the committee required to examine tone was not set up. Uh, Sir John Ferns, um, who was club president at the time, was fined a pretty substantial one pound, two shillings and nine pence for failing to do this. Um, it was a fine, happy club. There was no frivolity um, in, in this dimension of its, um, of its life. Some clubs in 18th century Dublin delight in, 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 in imposing fines, but then the, 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 the payment takes the, the, the part of a, of a bottle of claret that one would then share with the membership. The catch club wasn't like that. Um, it took its fining pretty seriously. Tone was initially proposed by Dr. James Gle Cleghorn, who was a medic, uh, and Henry, Henry Humphrey, Henry Humphrey uh, who I'm afraid I've, I've, I've yet to identify, uh, um, under that new rule, the musical expert rule. Um, but the fact that, that Tone had broader acceptability to the club was indicated that in March 1790, two new members, two other members, nominated him under the conventional membership route. And his new friends were the printer George Grierson and the military officer Charles Moore McMahon. Of course, club embarrassment over the cock-up uh, might have played a part there. But nevertheless, on 30th of March 1790, Wolftone was balloted for and accepted into the club. Not only did he have backers, but he was also without enemies because by the, um, by the um, submission of a single black ball, um, as was very common in club culture at, the, uh, at this time, you could be vetoed from membership. As for his new friends, George Grierson was a contemporary of Tones at Trinity College Dublin, Charles Moore McMahon was a lieutenant from County Carlow and was military very well connected. So Tone paid his two pounds, five shillings, sixpence fee, uh, and in the March, April membership list, he's given as the club's 43rd member. The spring of 1790 did not seem like the most lively period in the club's history. And so perhaps Tone wondered whether this was money well spent. On February the 23rd, only two members attended the ordinary weekly meeting. 
on the 2nd of March, there were four members. The charge for dinner that month was very much on the low, low side. The, the membership tended to, to be much higher on, on, on the official dinner days. 20th of April, five members attended. 4th of May, there were six. It's very difficult to gauge the full extent of Tone's attendance as payment records are only complete for dinner days. So you have full list for dinner days, but nothing for any, for, for any of the other, day, um, the, the, the other meeting days. So we only really have a sense of whether, whether he, he turns up on, the, on those key days. Um, if a club member failed to turn up and pays five shillings uh, by eight o'clock on a dinner day, he would be excluded from the club. That, that's in the rules. They didn't always in, 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 impose that. Um, the president could, however, appeal to other members to cover that fee, um, or or, if, uh, or a half crown absence fee, uh, absence fee if they weren't going to attend. Tone was saved on a number of occasions from this ignominy by friends in the club, uh, unlike some of his fellow singers. And we've got lots of examples of, of individuals being kicked out for um, for not 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 turning up for dinner uh, and not paying. Even the celebrated John Andrew Stevenson, the composer John Andrew Stevenson, was excluded for a period prior to the height of his fame in the early 19th century. Um, the, the best bit about this is that John Andrew Stevenson is excluded for missing a meeting that Tone also misses. But Tone is saved by a friend in the club, and John, John Andrew Stevenson, one of the greatest composers in Irish history, is kicked out. Um, on this occasion, James Cleghorn stands in, stands in for him. Tone attended more regularly in May and June 1790, and, uh, and his, his time in the, in, in, the, in the club coincides with two of, two of his early pamphlets. Um, one, uh, um, uh, a Whiggish critique uh, of the conduct of the Irish Parliament, uh, and uh, another, um, uh, an attack on, um, on, um, on, um, on, on British um, foreign policy, uh, if, if you like. Um, so, so he's busy doing other things at the same time. In September, he returns to the club again. Um, uh, and um, sorry, um, in, in September, he, he returns to writing once again, rather than to the club, um, with Thomas Russell this time as an accomplice. And, um, and it's at this point that he's back on the subject of a, of, of a potential military colony in the Sandwich, uh, Sandwich Islands, which he sends to, to the British government. Um, Unsurprisingly, given the multitude of, dis of distractions, and he's also living in an Irish town in Dublin, so he's not right in the centre. Um, uh, th this period, it's, Irish town is near is near uh, Ring's End. Ring's end. Um, his his involvement with the Catch Club is, is fitful, uh, and at the start of the new autumn season, he's again an absentee, um, and is saved again by um, by his friends in the club, James Cleghorn, George Grierson, still paying his fines. Um, then he re returns to, to, to Dublin after his, his wife recovers from a bout of illness. Um, we can see that because he buys the Catch Club's um, prize-winning glee um, in, in November. Um, he's then, he then misses meetings again and is, um, is subsidised by John Whitley, Whitley Stokes. Um, Cleghorn subsidises again uh, and, uh, and then we have Tone back for a period. And then other members advising him, John Farron and Henry Doyle. I'll mention some of these some of these names in in, in, a, in a little more detail in, in a moment. I think the, the key point I want to get 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 across though is the range of backers that he has in the club is is impressive. It's not just the ones who nominate him. And in 1791, that's the end. Um, uh, as far as we're aware, certainly he doesn't come back um, um, to dinner days. Um, by the end of um, by 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 autumn 1791, um, by the end of the year, Tone has Tone has resigned. Henry Humphrey paying his final fees and is replaced in the club by James Whitestone, another barrister. The nature of the surviving dinner list seems to indicate that when the debts um, covered were paid, the name of the individual coming forward was crossed out. This does not seem to happen in Tone's case, possibly leaving him indebted to a range of friends and to James Cleghorn in particular. We can sketch out the backgrounds of some of the individuals who supported Tone in a financial capacity. Um, Grierson, a leading Dublin printer, he, he probably knew at Trinity College Dublin, they were contemporaries there. Um, Clegg Horner, as I said, was a physician. Henry Doyle was a barrister and, and, and Tone trains as a barrister, so, um, so that's perhaps not surprising. Um, the Whitley Stokes family, 
offer a more direct connection to Tone's radical activity. John Whitley Stokes was another barrister and a relation of Whitley Stokes, a Trinity College medic who was suspended from the college for his radicalism by order of um, the Lord Chancellor John Fitzgibbon. Um, Whitley Stokes is part of the first iteration of the United Irishman. Um, I'll just put up a, a list of some of the key um, backers of, uh, of, of Tome that I'm, that I'm talking about. Um, and I've got, I think I've gone through most of those. Um, John Farron with, has print and, uh, and law um, connections. This next list, list is slightly different. These are individuals who, though they don't formally back Tone during his time in the club, have very, very clear radical connections. Um, so uh, David Gelling, uh, sorry, S um, Sisson Putland Darling uh, is made an honorary uh, member of the club in 1798, taught Tone at his educational academy. He's, he's Whiggish in his inclinations. Uh, David Gelling of Dame Street uh, was a hatter and umbrella manufacturer, um, long-term member of the club, and he becomes a United Irishman. He overlaps with Tone. Francis Megan, uh, his fame lies, lies chiefly in his activities as a government informer during the 1790s as po while posing as a member of the United Irishman. Um, most particularly was responsible for providing the information that leads to the arrest and death of Lord Edward Fitzgerald. George Knox, MP for TCD, uh, for TCD was godfather to Tone's, so, Tone's son, not, not a radical. The last one on, the, on, the, on this list is, is very interesting, Stephen Armitage, bookseller, Printer and, and I've got got them there. King of Dolky, um, a, a Dublin um, a, a Dublin su suburb. If you if you know it, um, Armitage is, is head of a semi fictional club called the Kingdom of Dolky and its offices. Uh, it published its own club history in the Dublin Morning Post newspaper. It was very democratic. It supported the United Irishman uh, and it um, and for example, it complained at the unsafe convictions of Hamilton Rowan and William Jackson in the mid 1790s. But this club. Um, the, 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 the Kingdom of Dolky also had musical connections um, and an Armitage sang there. Um, the United Irish, um, the frequent uh, lawyer for the United Irishman, Philpott, uh, John Philpott Curran, um, also sang there. Um, the radical poet, there's a, there's a female member of the, um, of, of the Kingdom of, of Dolky, which there isn't for the Hibernian Catch, Catch Club, uh, Henrietta Battier, um, and, um, and she's known I wouldn't say she was particularly well known as a, as a, as a poet now, uh, but she she um, she published some anti-orange order poet uh, poems in the in, in this period. Um, the other individual associated with the kingdom the, the kingdom of Dolky is um, is is um, is the writer and poet Thomas More. Tone's resignation from the Catch Club at the end of 1791 certainly makes sense when other factors are considered. Uh, in August 1791, he publishes his argument on behalf of the Catholics of Ireland by a Northern Whig, and it's a huge success, selling thousands of copies in Dublin, Belfast and beyond. And his trip to Belfast in the autumn resulted in the formation of the, of the Society of United Irishmen, along with Thomas Russell and Samuel Nielsen. Uh, he then returned to Dublin in the company of James Napper Tandy, and Simon Butler and forms the Dublin version of the society. Inveterate clubman and sociable being that Tone was, it's difficult to imagine him finding the time for, his in, for, um, for, the, for, the, for this musical club, which was attendant spotting, fine, happy, um, and, uh, and perhaps not of the kind of conviviality that, that, um, that, that he really appreciated. So the next section I, I want to move to is, um, is, is to talk a little bit about the other members of the, of, of the Catch Club. And, um, and I've put some, some up on the screen. Um, Tone's background fits perfectly with the middling sort membership of the club. They were members of the legal, medical, academic, military and financial professions who his family would have broke, rubbed shoulders with. A number of members were associated with Trinity College Dublin and some had been students there at the same time as Tone. Lots, lots were associated with print and obviously print is very important to the United Irishman. Um, musical publishing um, um, is, is, is unsurprisingly quite common. Many members were also associated with Dublin Corporation. Um, th those responsible for, for the local government dimension of, of, of Dublin life. Just to mention a few, there's a few on the, on the, on the list here and I've given them very brief um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, work related labels uh, next to their names, but I'll, I'll pause on John Perry 
Um, he was an, uh, he, uh, an attorney. Um, he um, was not only a, a, a member, but a very, very prominent member, one of the most important in the club. He would have known many United Irishmen through his involvement in radical Dublin politics. He was aligned with James Napatandi in the, in the 1790s. Um, he was a member of the aggregate meeting of the city of Dublin, which was crucial in, in terms of the, um, um, the, the drive towards parliamentary reform in 1784. Um, although, although Perry wasn't a, a member at precisely that, that moment. And, um, and then the next, um, the next slide gives a sense uh, of, um, of the link between radical politics, print culture and, and the Catch Club. Uh, a new ballad on the con Congress lately uh, assembled in William Street sung to the tune of, of Derry Down. I, I, won't go, go, I won't go through it, um, but there's a clear link in, in some, of the, some of these lines between the Catch Club and radical politics. Um, Sharman and you and other are the two radical politicians um, uh, named, named here. It doesn't necessarily mean the, um, the, the Hibernian um, uh, Catch Club is, is radical in this period. There, there may, be a, may be a sense of that, but... Um, but I wanted to illustrate how important that the Catch Club is to the to, to print culture in, in this period and, and, and the way in which um, it, um, it, its activities are, are, can be used to serve satirical purposes when, when attacking, um, uh, attacking politicians. The King, Kingdom of Dolky is, is another great example, um, which has its own history within another newspaper. Uh, and again, that's a, that, that's a society with a musical, a musical bent. I could give a list of, uh, of the varieties of clubable activities of members, uh, masonry, um, Freemasonry, membership of the Dublin Society was also very common, Royal Irish Academy, financial, charitable societies. It's very clear that, that, cl that club culture is really important to the membership, not just a tone. Interestingly, there are also a number of indi individuals associated with conservative or loyalist politics. Blake Woodward was a member for the Association for Discountenance, Discountenancing, sorry, Vice, as was James Cleghorn, who nominated Tone, Alex Jaffrey, uh, and Peter Latouche. It's a body with a heavy Anglican church membership, including Richard Woodward, Bishop of Cloyne, who plays a key role in enshrining Protestant ascendancy in the 1790s. This society also printed Hannah Moore's cheap repository tracts, sometimes, sometimes carelessly, probably, referred to as Burke for Beginners, Edmund Burke for Beginners. Um, so, so these individuals, in terms of a political divider, are on absolutely the opposite side to, to, to Wolf Tone uh, and existing in the, same, in the same club. Many of the lawyers in the club are also involved in prosecuting United Irishmen. Um, James, James Whitestone was the lawyer responsible uh, for prosecuting James Napatandi in, in his trial for provoking and challenging the Dublin Castle supporting MP John Toler to fight him in a duel. Uh, we, we see more of that, unsurprisingly, in the 1790s. And even if, if, if people are interested, I'm, I'm not going to talk about 1848 in this paper, but when, when it comes to 1848, um, uh, uh, some of the, the, the leading Irish radicals at that point are again tried by members of the, um, the, 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 the Hibernian, Hibernian Caps Club. Given this intermingling between radical and, uh, and loyalist culture, it's not surprising that balloting for members became fractious. It led to the following decision, and this is a quote from its, um, it, its records, to make balloting more comfortable um, to its intent, the box be placed at the lower end of the room where each member present is to put his bean. In other words, a certain amount of privacy is being provided for, for those willing, uh, those, those seeking to cast their, their membership votes. Um, one example that, that might have uh, really needed this, this privacy is, is, is um, St. George O'Kelly's um, uh, balloting for membership. He was uh, a printer of the government's in-house newspaper, The Gazette, and he attempted to join the Hibernian Catch Club in 1790, mid-1790, when Tone was there. Um, um, and um, and he, go, he goes through a number of, uh, number of rejections. Um, and he's another individual who's involved in a lawsuit with James Napatandi. Um, whether, the, whether that has anything to do with his rejection, is a moot point, but they are, there are United Irishmen in the club, and um, and, and it would, would only take one one um, black bean or black ball to actually reject. Okay, so the final area I, I want to talk about before concluding is is another kind of divide within the club. Um, 
gentlemen versus players, one might refer to it as it's not quite as, as accurate as, as that, but, but there, there's a little bit of it, uh, a little bit of that going on. The, the wealthy um, amateurs versus the, um, the, 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 the professional singers who are finding as many ways as possible to, to supplement their wages um, at St. Patrick's Cathedral or, or Christchurch. A number of members were, were in that latter category and, and, and defined primarily by their musical abilities. Um, just to give you some, exa some examples, um, Dr. Langrish Doyle, uh, Chief Organist at Christchurch and, and St. Patrick's Cathedral, Cathedrals, John Spray, uh, a tenor singer and vicar choral at Dublin's Cathedrals, John Andrew Stevenson, who I've talked about before, the composer, um, Philip Cogan, David Wayman. Um, there, there are um, their, their associations are, um, are on, the, um, on the screen. Uh, the music historian Barra Boydell has commented on the tensions that existed between the canonical duties of the likes of John Spray and their eagerness to embrace alternative kinds of public performance. They are professional moonlighters and they're always getting in trouble with the authorities in, in St. Patrick's and Christchurch for this. Another interesting, interesting aspect to this, to this non-Christchurch, non-St. Non Patrick's performance is that they, they, they frequently perform in, in, in Catholic chapels. Uh, Spray, Wayman uh, and Hogan all do this. And again, and again that, that's not always um, welcomed by, by church, um, by church uh, authorities. Um, and the fact that these, these, these performances are, are occurring in the 1790s during heightened times of heightened sectarian tension, I, I think that, that's, that, that's noteworthy. Though not political in the sense of tone or even Dublin Corporation members, some of these musicians provide important links to some of the key figures associated with Irish Romanticism. Uh, the poet Thomas More, uh, whose lines commemorated the death of Robert Emmett and who later wrote a biography of Lord Edward Fitzgerald, was a close collaborator of John Andrew Stevenson. Uh, and a friend of, of Stephen Armitage, King of, um, King of Dorking. Uh, Moore and Stevenson eventually combine on a selection of Irish melodies, first published in 1808. Um, and the romantic nationalism of, of the Irish melodies are underpinned by, on Moore's side by much stronger views on reform and the dangers of, of, of sectarianism. Um, I could talk a little bit about more afterwards and, 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 um, uh, and, and how he fits into both this, the, the musical, musical side and, 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 and the, the political side of the, of the club if anybody's, um, if anybody's interested. Setting that, that, that um, yeah, just, just to mention one other at the, at the bottom there, Terence McGrath, another vicar choral gave Walter Scott's daughters um, singing lessons. So there's, there's a number of individuals with, with, um, with connections with, um, to, to Irish romanticism. Setting that aside though, what, what we see in the 1790s is a much more divisive form of politics in the club uh, and a push by some members to ensure that the musical functions of the club remained preeminent. They wanted more money to, spend, to be spent on music. They wanted um, admission fees to be spent on this. They also wanted security for the music. Um, there, there are lots of quite comic elements in the club accounts. Um, people stealing music um, is, is, is pretty frequent and people being fined for not returning, uh, returning um, uh, music, hence the, um, the, the um, determination to have, to have a much more secure way of, um, of, of keeping it. In the autumn of 1799, um, there's a more direct attempt to shift the balance of the club. Um, and I won't read out all, all, this, all this club, but effectively the musical members of the, of the club, um, Dr. Stevens is, is, in the, is in the lead there. Um, the, uh, as, as you might see on the room, on the quote there, the real catch singers at sight. They want to be allowed to introduce whoever they wanted with musical talent on any given dinner, dinner day. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a limit, um, not, not to exceed four and, and, um, and um, that there can be a censure if they're not good enough, but ultimately that's what they want to do. They want to be able to bolster the, the, the musical prowess of those who go. Um, interestingly, this doesn't get through. Um, we're not entirely sure why, but 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 clearly um, there there are issues with the new um, with the new proposal, and it's withdrawn on the twenty sixth of November. Um, it may have been entirely coincidental, but at the next meeting after it's withdrawn, five new members were considered for membership, uh, and new, mem new members were, were pretty rare in this period. Um, and none of these, none of those five new members 
um, are musicians. So it's almost as if the the, the socialites are, are reacting to this this attempt by the musicians to um, to, to wield greater power in the, in, the, in the club. And the, and that, that's just one example. I, I haven't got got time to go in, go into um, into more now. I'm afraid. Um, the, this 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 is one other um, featuring um, George Grierson um, uh, again on, on on tensions between music musicians and socialites um, and um, and George Grierson um, has obviously fallen out with them with the, the catch singers and has to issue a formal um, apology um, for the way uh, the way in which he's um, uh, the way in which he's behaved um, to, to this particular group. Grierson is also part of one of my favourite episodes in the inner club's uh, club's history. Although for the most part the account books are fairly dry, recordings of the proceedings of the club, the presence of a number of individuals involved in the world of print culture in Dublin does allow a little frivolity to enter their pa their pages. The entry for a meeting um, um, in uh, in, the, in the early nineteenth century is a case in point, uh, and of interest for a number of reasons. The printer George Grierson was in the chair and no other members are present. He's the only one who turns up. Um, that, that's not, I wouldn't say that was usual, but there are a few cases where, where only one person ends up turning up. Uh, amusingly, he still has the meeting on his own and he records the proceedings in the account book. Uh, the president having read to himself the proceedings of the last dinner day, resolved to eat one quarter of a hundred of excellent and curious Carlingford oysters, to drink a pint of porter and a tumbler of pachin, uh, which was accordingly done to the great satisfaction of the present company. Um, following uh, his repast, he resolved that the Hibernian Catch Club never spent a more peaceable nor more in, uh, an interesting evening. And then he resolved, as a true Irishman, that whenever there is any other member present, he will never sup alone, it being decidedly in opposition to his general custom and constitution. Uh, after 10 o'clock, no other business having occurred, the president adjourned the meeting until the following Tuesday evening after drinking his own health three times three. So Grierson was giving us a sense, I think, of the nature of a typical club meeting. Dinner would be eaten, resolutions would be made, and toasts would also be included. Tellingly, perhaps there's no reference to music. Um, that, that, that's particularly significant given that Grierson seems to be falling out with the, with the catch singers all the time. There's also a certain amount of bitterness in the recording of the, the event. The meeting was at least peaceable, uh, and they clearly weren't always that. Uh, the references to the to conviviality of the Irishman ring rather hollow as he was forced on this occasion to dine alone. Um, there was also potentially a knock-on effect for Dublin's traders, who on this occasion had clearly overcatered, even though Grierson had gamely eaten 25 oysters. One wonders how he felt after that. Um, the, the fines levied for non-attendance are of critical importance to Dubliners who provide the food at, at dinner nights. The account book shown that the fines levied in December 1788 go directly to William Fleming, who provides the catering. Some members are careless with their debts to the clubs uh, and happy for other club members to foot the bill or to trespass on the um, generosity of others to, to help them out and step forward um, at Wolf's home. Okay, um, I'll, I'll conclude here. I should probably begin by, by apologizing to everyone for taking the music out of the, the Hibernian Catch Club, apart from the, the, the bit you heard at the very beginning, favoring, favoring instead the fraternal and the sociable. In my defense, it could be suggested that for many members, the convivial side of club life was more important than the participation in music making. The attendance lists certainly indicate that the monthly dinners were the most attractive feature of the club and the annual ball even more so. This commitment and conviviality is also revealed in the way in which clubs intersected with each other. Some club men must have seen each other regularly in a variety of different social contexts. The growth of radical politics in the 1790s put a strain on such relationships. Individuals with radically different political allegiances could coexist in different societies in the early 1790s, but the strain became intolerable for many by the end of the decade. There's no direct evidence uh, of political fallout in the Hibernian Catch Club, um, at a similar point in, in, uh, in, in the 1790s, someone was actually thrown out of the window of the old woman of Skinner's Alley club, uh, club meeting. So, um, so perhaps they were, they were slightly better behaved. But tensions certainly existed over nominations to the club and rule changes helped solve this particular issue. In terms of Wolf Tom's career, it adds further luster to Ireland's most famous radical. He was a wit and a valued presence in Dublin's clubland, 
And more, and more than that, in this context, he was, it seems, a polymath, being deemed, at least by his friends, able to mix it with the best catch singers at, uh, at sight in the club, some of whom were professionals. He continued to care about music, and we see it interweaving in other facets of his life. His witty correspondence with, with Russell included reference to popular songs of the period. He was also happy to spend convivial hours with a range of individuals from Dublin society. In part, this was sociability with a purpose, a purpose beyond even music making. Membership of the club propelled Tone into the society of those who were a bit above him in Dublin's social hierarchy. He may have known some of them at Trinity College, but even his fast friends were generally better off than he, financially speaking. The heterogeneous member of the Hibernian Catch Club meant that for Tone, some would be his political opponents, others natural allies. Some would join him as members of the United Irishmen, others were involved in their prosecution. By the end of the century, even those that might have sympathised with Tone were moving towards the safety of loyalism. The 19th century incarnation of the club was loyal. There's no traces of radicalism really by the mid 19th century. Tone was not a regular attender, but he clearly knew how to sing a catch and a glee and would have known the musical diet enjoyed by the membership. The material produced by the likes of John A. Stevenson became rather more complicated in the, in the Romantic period as he collaborated with Thomas More. But during the years that Tone was in the club, the diet was catches and glees that have been badged as a very English vocal performance. Historians have crossed swords over Tone's commitment to native Irish music, the quote, strum, strum and be hanged as, as, as exercised uh, um, a number of writers. Perhaps they can return to arms over his willingness to engage a very English alternative. And I'll stop there. Thank you.